Morphs, what exactly are they? How do you know what you're going to get when you breed two leopard geckos together? And what does het mean? Well in this video I hope to answer all these questions and more as we delve into the fascinating world of leopard gecko genetics. But before we get on to morphs, I want to make sure you guys know a few key words just so nobody gets left behind. First let's look at this, now this is obviously a leopard gecko and what you're currently looking at is its phenotype. A phenotype is a visual result of an animal's genotype, environment and random variation. So what's a genotype? A genotype is an individual's group of genes. A gene for a particular trait can exist in the form of two alleles. An allele occupies a specific spot on a chromosome called a locus which controls the same trait. One allele can be dominant, which is represented as a capital, so in this case it would be a capital A, and the other allele can be recessive, which is represented as a lowercase, so for this example it will be a lowercase a. Based on this, a leopard gecko can have three possible genotypes. Two big A's, which is homozygous dominant, two little A's, homozygous recessive, and one big A and one little A, which is heterozygous. Now the easy way I remember the difference between homozygous and heterozygous is I think if someone's homosexual, they like someone of the same sex, and if someone's heterosexual, they like someone of the different or opposite sex. So homozygous is where two alleles are the same, whereas heterozygous is where two alleles are different. Now, leopard geckos have 19 pairs of chromosomes. This is actually four less than humans. One major chromosome they are lacking is the sex chromosome, since their gender is actually determined by the temperature they're incubated in the early stages of development whilst they're in the egg. Now, let's look at a term you may be more familiar with, morph. Some people mistake the term morph with just something you name a phenotype, so whatever the gecko looks like on the outside, people think that's its morph. But this isn't completely true since there's only really about 15 confirmed morphs. Eclipse, Giant, Mac Snow, Tug Snow, Gem Snow, Blizzard, Murphy's Patternless, Rainwater Albino, Bell Albino, Tremper Albino, Lemon Frost, Marble Eye, Enigma, Normal or Wild Type, and White and Yellow. Now, you may be wondering, what about tangerines and bandits? You know, what are they classed as? Well, these are actually known as polygenic traits or line bred traits. Line bred traits are controlled by increase or decrease of alleles. So the more intense a trait is in the parent, the more likely you'll see that trait in the offspring. Basically, if a line bred gecko like a tangerine is bred to a normal morph, almost all the first generation of babies will show tangerine. However, if you keep breeding the gecko with a trait to geckos outside the family, it's more likely that the trait will fade away. So in order to establish that initial trait, a lot of inbreeding occurs. However, if you do not introduce new geckos into the genetic mix every three to five generations, you end up with quite a lot of ill, infertile and majorly inbred geckos. So now I've explained that, let's look back at the morphs. Now you may have noticed that next to the names there are words such as dominant and recessive. Now these refer to dominant and recessive alleles. Dominant alleles pretty much do what their name says, they dominate the overall look of a gecko. Dominant alleles will always cancel out recessive ones, for example you only need one dominant allele for the trait to be seen. An example of this is if you're going to cross a normal or wild type leopard gecko with a blizzard, the normal type is the dominant one. For our example, it will be represented by a capital N because it's dominant. Then the blizzard is recessive, so it'll be represented by a lowercase b. Now we're going to put them in a Punnett square. Now by the way, a Punnett square is used to predict the outcome of a particular breeding project. So in this case, we'll say the blizzard is a dad and we'll go on along the top, so BB, and the normal is a mum, so it will go along the side, NN. Now you'll get the exact same result if the dad was normal and the mum was blizzard. It doesn't really matter. So if we fill in the Punnett square, take the N's and add the B's, and we can see that 100% of the offspring will look like their mum and be normal, since the capital N is the dominant allele, but they will all carry the recessive allele, blizzard. 
So when you're looking up leopard geckos for sale and you see the word het, this refers to the fact the animal is carrying a recessive allele, which is not visible. So the offspring of this particular pairing will be normal het blizzard. Het is short for heterozygous, remember the long words from the start of this video. So let's quickly touch upon recessive alleles. Now in order for these to be shown, there must be two of the same alleles present. Now if we take an offspring from our last example who is heterozygous since it carries one dominant and one recessive allele, and bred it with a blizzard who is homozygous recessive since it carries two of the same recessive alleles, we would get the following. NB, NB, BB and BB. This shows that 50% of the offspring will visually look like blizzards and the other 50% will look normal but will be carrying the blizzard allele. So the ones that look normal will be known as normal het blizzard. Now be aware these percentages are only probabilities. There aren't many recessive alleles, only Tremper albino, Rainwater albino, Bell albino, blizzard, Murphy's patternless, Eclipse and Marble Eye. Next, I'm going to quickly touch upon incomplete dominant alleles. Now, incomplete dominance is where neither allele is dominant. The two alleles basically blend together to create a new blended phenotype. And in leopard geckos, it's usually known as a superversion. For example, if you breed two Maxnos together, they may produce Supersnos or Super Maxnos. Another example of incomplete dominance is giants. If you breed two giant leopard geckos together, you'll get about 25% normal sized, 50% giants and 25% super giants. Now, the topic of leopard gecko genetics can be very complex, as you could probably tell. And I feel that in this video, I'm only scratching the surface. So if you're truly interested in breeding your leopard geckos, I seriously urge you guys to do a lot more research. And if you want me to go in more depth with genetics in future videos, let me know in the comments section below. Okay, so now I've explained all that, I would like to briefly move on to pet store geckos and why I wouldn't encourage using them in a breeding project. And the main reason is you really don't have enough information about the gecko's genetic background to be truly confident in what you're breeding with. So for example, if you're looking at these two geckos in a shop, what would you say they were? Mm-hmm. Mm, wow, yeah. Mm. Yeah, exactly. You might say Murphy's patternless. You would be correct for the one on the right, however the one on the left is actually Murphy's Blizzard. Now some of you may have got that right as well, but if you're in a store and they put this down, oh here's a patternless leopard gecko and you get it and you breed it with another one, you may be a little bit surprised when a random blizzard might pop out, okay? So you can't tell from looking at a gecko if it's homozygous, heterozygous. Even the best trained eyes, the best breeders in the business can't look at a gecko and be sure of its genetic history. So I know a lot of people will probably message me and message many other people who have leopard geckos and ask whether we can tell what their morph is or what their genetic history is. And honestly, we can't. We have no clue. And I think that if you're gonna buy from a shop, you should just sort of be content that you won't know. I have Diego, he's from a shop, they just told me he's albino. So that's pretty much useless to me. And so to me, he could be a banana custard souffle for all like care. It really doesn't matter, he's a yellow gecko. It's fine. Um, and that actually moves me on to people always asking me why I don't breed my geckos. And that's a massive reason. I mean, one of them, obviously, I don't want to breed my geckos. But the other one is that he is some sort of albino that I don't even know what he is. Whereas if I bred him with Ziggy, she is a raptor. So she's a tremper albino. I'll have no clue what their offspring are. So it would be absolutely useless. So this moves me on to the final part of the video ethics. Now there are certain things you really shouldn't do. Number one, you shouldn't mix the three strains of albino together because basically all the offspring will be normal and you'll have no clue which strain of albino they het for. The next point is do not mix eye pigment traits such as eclipse and marble eye. And finally, do not mix the three snows, gem, tug and mac and possibly the lime bread snows as well. So we finally came to the end of this video. I cannot tell you how much time and effort has gone into this. Myself and Mike from the channel Fun With Life have been working on this for over a month now. 
and I can't thank him enough for all the questions he's answered for me, the footage he's provided, and all the tons of information he's given me. I truly appreciate it. Also, it was his idea in the first place to do this video, so credit where credit is due. <laughs> but yeah, check out his channel. He also has some great footage of the Lemon Frost, which is the newest morph, which is amazing, but very, very expensive. Also, I'd like to thank Dylan from Gecko Labs for looking over the script. Rena for doing all this amazing artwork and the subscribers of this channel who sent in their photos just for this video so thank you so much everyone who's helped out this has truly been a joint effort i really hope you found this helpful and enjoyed this video thank you very much for watching